thousand forests and rivers goes back to my early childhood. I did not experience mountains, forests and rivers as some kind of a natural resource, but as a life beyond ourselves. From the age of 12 to 17, almost every day I swam in Kaveri, the places where I used to swim. Today if I go, I can just walk across the river. You cannot swim anymore. When I was little over 17, I rafted down Kaveri River from Bagamangla to Mysore, 163 kilometers, and just four truck tubes and a few bamboos by myself. I lived on the river for 13 days. My experience of the river was not that it's a water body, but it was a life well beyond myself, a much larger life. People like you and me come and go, but the river flows. For millions of years it's been flowing. But today, this summer, Kaveri did not touch the ocean for more than three and a half months. 170 kilometers short of the ocean, it stopped. The entire length of Kaveri is 807 kilometers. In Tamil Nadu, it is only 430 kilometers. Out of this 430, 170 kilometers short of the ocean, it stopped. Well, but you have a worse example. Krishna has not touched ocean for almost three years in a row. The water that you see in Krishna is not Krishna's water, it is Godavari water. So transporting water from one river to another is a temporary solution. It's an emergency solution so that people don't die. But that's not a solution for the rivers. Keeping the rivers alive, making sure that rivers flow for 12 months of the year is an important commitment that we as a generation of people must fulfill for all the young people who are sitting here. If these boys and girls have to live a reasonably good life, our rivers must be flowing. Otherwise there is no way. Any amount of wealth, any amount of industry, any amount of stock markets flying all over the world is not going to make our life. Protecting our soil and water is the most fundamental wealth in this country. To just give you a brief understanding of this, there are two types of rivers, glacier-fed rivers and forest-fed rivers. In this country, only 4% of the water, river water, is glacier-fed. 96% is forest-fed. The snowfall in Himalayas is declining, but that's a global situation. We can't fix it here. The world has to change. But the rest of the rivers, 96% of the water, is forest-fed. What forest-fed means is, when precipitation happens, when rain happens, in our country, an average rainfall in the country is only for 40 to 45 days in the year. This water that comes down during monsoon times for 40 to 45 days, this we must be able to hold in the soil and slowly let, let it flow for 12 months or 365 days. But if this has to happen, the only way it can happen is there must be substantial vegetation, root system and bioactivity where the water that comes sinks down into the soil and slowly flows out in the form of small rivulets, streams and then rivers. But we have removed a huge amount of forests and tree cover. Most of the land in the country is open to sun. When the land becomes open to sun, all life in the topsoil begins to die or withdraw further down into the earth. In India, the topsoil in this country is only about 15 inches average. But every year, we are losing about 5.3 billion tons of topsoil, which is more than a millimeter per year. In 15 inches, if you're losing a millimeter per year, how many years does it take 
to lose the entire topsoil and make this into a desert. To mix, to keep soil as soil, we need a certain level of organic content. <coughs> the United Nations says a minimum of 2% organic content must be there to call soil as soil. But today in states like Punjab, Haryana, Maratwada, some parts of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh, the organic content in the soil is 0.05%, not 0.5, 0.05%. This means this soil is going to become sand in the next three to five years' time. 25% of India will become a desert in the next five years unless we put back substantial organic content back into the soil. Every crop that we take out of the soil, we are actually taking out the topsoil. But we have no way of putting back the organic content because of only two ways you can put back organic content is either by the leaves of the trees, the leaves of the trees, and the animal waste. These are the only two ways you can enrich the soil. The trees are gone long time ago. Animals are all traveling overseas these days. See, if we, for our requirement, if we cut an animal and eat, that is not the problem. The problem is millions of animals are going away. When we are exporting this, what is going away is not meat. What is going away is topsoil. We must have a way. Either we must have sufficient trees or we must have sufficient animals. If both these things are missing, there is no way to enrich the soil. Because of this, they are saying, the scientific estimates say, in the next 40 years, 60% of India's soil will be uncultivable. We have many things in this country. In the last 70 years, we have built businesses, we built infrastructure, we built industry, our scientists are going to the Mars. But the most significant achievement in this country is without, without any kind of scientific or technological help and with very little infrastructure, our illiterate farmer has been feeding 1.3 billion people. This is the greatest achievement in the country. But unfortunately, we are pulling the rug from under his feet. Whenever farmers commit suicide, over three lakh farmers have committed suicide in the last 10 to 12 years' time. Three lakh farmers, three lakh people taking their own life. This is not a joke. Even in all the three wars that we have fought, we have not lost three lakh people. From both sides, I'm saying. But three lakh farmers commit suicide in this country. Every time somebody commits suicide, the explanations that we are giving is, oh, that is because tomato prices dropped, so he died. Or a bank is pursuing him hard, that's why he died. <coughs> no, I want you to look at it this way. If you and me get into farming in a place where the soil is not fertile and there is not enough water, believe me, both of us will commit suicide. Yes, it will be heartbreaking to do agriculture in a place where the soil is not rich and there is not enough water. Without adequate water and fertility in the soil, farming is a disastrous activity. Today you ask any farmer, if you make a survey you will see, only less than 15% of the farmers would want their children to go into farming. What this means is, in another 25 to 30 years, we won't know how to grow our food. Already in the last four years, 17% of our pulses are being imported. Pulses means the dals that we are eating. Nobody eats dal like Indian people, okay? We must be growing the dal, but 17% of our requirement is coming from Brazil, Thailand, Cambodia, all kinds of places. They don't eat dal, they're growing it for us because we are losing our ability to grow these things when that is our main diet in so many ways. For most of the Indian people, the main <coughs> protein is dal. Unfortunately, we are not able to grow it, and our ability to grow food is slowly receding. And if this has to be fixed, first and foremost thing is to fix the water bodies and the soil. And uh, it is very, very, very heartening to see both Telangana and Andhra Pradesh have taken the right steps. 
building a huge dam and storing many square kilometers of water is not a good thing to do in a tropical country. Temperatures are reaching over 50 degrees in Vijayawada or many other places in Andhra Pradesh. If you store water in a dam, the evaporation losses are over 80 percent. If the temperatures are between 30 to 35 degrees, the evaporation losses are anywhere between 65 to 70 percent. But if it's over 50 degrees, the evaporation losses are over 80 percent. What is the point of storing water, destroying the river, and evaporating it? 80 percent, only 20 percent you can use. The right <coughs> method for a tropical country is what is being right now being done in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh to bring back the lakes and the ponds and the vegetation around it. This is the only way you can do it in a tropical country. There are many other aspects to this. We are in the process, or we are almost finishing this policy document, a draft policy document, which runs to nearly 700 pages, which takes into account all the stakeholders involved. When I say all the stakeholders, the first stakeholder is the river. The river must flow 12 months of the year. And the life that is sustained by the river, when I say life sustained by the river, India, as a subcontinent has the highest number of species of life in fresh water. We have over 1,000 fish species in this country. No other continent on the planet has this. Kya machali kate hai So the kind of fish that your grandfather was eating and what you're eating today, the variety of fish has come down dramatically al already. Yes or no? Yes, yes. It has come down dramatically because they're no more available. When a perennial river becomes seasonal, the fish that is living in the area and every other life that is living in the area is completely extinct. We don't have a study to exactly pinpoint what's happened but the scientists, es the scientists estimate in the last 25 years, nearly 15 to 20 percent of the species might have gone extinct. India is the only place which even has freshwater dolphins in the rivers, which is not possible anywhere else. But all this is being lost at a very rapid pace in one generation. We as a generation of people have taken the largest bite of this planet. When I was... 50 years ago, how I saw the rivers. We want to make sure in the next 25 years, the rivers will be like that. When they're young, if they don't see it, at least when these youth become old, they must see the rivers as we saw it. But today, they think the river is a sandbed because they're only seeing sandbeds. They think river means a sandbed. River is not a sandbed. This is post-monsoon, okay? This is post-monsoon. This year, monsoons have been late, and monsoons have not been too bad this year. In spite of that, just go and see the rivers. All you see is sand. 